As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call not to the righteous, but to the sinners. Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Greetings, everyone. Sydney St. James. Today, I'm going to be presenting a prequel to my Mother's Day broadcast tomorrow. And when I say a prequel, I'm going to be talking about my other mother, my grandmother, the Reverend Ada Caston Slayton Bonds. When I go back and write novels, I write historical novels, science fiction novels, detective novels, and it goes on and on. But the one novel that I wrote, which is called Faith, 70 times 7, is so unbelievable sometimes when you watch this woman who was called by God to preach the gospel. You know, she was so abused her whole life almost by an alcoholic husband. And, but yet, every Sunday when she would preach her sermons, somehow, some way, she would find forgiveness. What an amazing woman she was. And we got together at least four or five times a year, and gosh, I really do remember all the wonderful things we did with my grandma and Pop Nelson, who was her second husband, who was a wonderful, caregiving man. Today's broadcast is about the struggles that she had in becoming one of the first six women ministers in the country to become ordained. That's right. And she was from Louisiana and she was a member of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And today, I will tell you the story that started back in 1914 in a little country church just outside Pleasant Hill, Louisiana, called Progress Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And hey, did you know they just celebrated another birthday? And they're still going strong, this little country church. So, get ready, stay tuned, and I'll tell you the story of one of the first six women ordained in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, known as Mother of All Presbyteries, known as First Lady of the Cloth, and known as the Reverend Mrs. Ada Slayton Bonds. Again, thanks for joining me today. And here we go.
I will be talking about a great pioneer woman who blazed the path for other women who came after them in the ministry. I actually have two moms that I want to talk about. and Today, this prequel to Mother's Day, which comes out tomorrow, I'll be talking about my birth mother. Of course, that's tomorrow. And today, I talk about the other woman who really helped to shape my life. That I wish to highlight as a pioneer woman who blazed the way and is still a mentor for so many women across America and other places around the world who want to be an ordained woman minister. Her name is the Reverend Ada Caston Slayton Bonds the first ordained woman minister in the state of Louisiana, a true pioneer who blazed a trail for other women who wished to spread the word of Christ from the pulpit and beyond. One who understood finding forgiveness for 20 long years in the trials associated with an alcoholic and abusive husband and one genuinely great woman I call my second mother, and I call her Grandma Ada. The story, the full story of her most challenging life is told in my novel Faith, 70 times 7, and a brief summary of her life is brought to you today in this podcast. I would like to use the words here now of my namesake, her son, my uncle Sidney Slayton, who was also a minister for many years in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. In this prequel to my Mother's Day podcast, let me repeat his words that he wrote from December 1947. It seems that the love and mercies of an almighty father have permitted us to approach another Mother's Day. And, of course, this means that I must withdraw from the life of haste and tension and pay honor and loving respect to her who travailed me to give me life and whose spirit and sacrifice influenced me to fear God and to love and to support that upon which the hand of the great Creator 
and so creatively rested. Please, don't think this is just a Mother's Day talk as some people have just Sunday religion. For out of the busy world of my ministerial life, there comes this reverent thought as we approach that memorable day. I am so proud to have been the son of so great a woman. And to follow that up, I would like to add that I am so proud to have been the grandson of so great a woman. In a yellowed and dark-eared Red Chief notebook dating from 1914 to the 1916s, Ada told a part of her memoirs of the difficulties of being accepted as a woman in the church. It was far more than just challenging. It was extremely difficult. Here's a note that she said. One Sunday, a man walked out of her church there at the Progress Cumberland Presbyterian Church outside the small town of Pleasant Hill, Louisiana. Having not researched the congregation before visiting, he was apparently appalled to discover the pastor of this tiny little house of worship was no other than a woman. Yep, that's right. A woman preaching the Word of God? He wrote to her later to explain that if she would just go and study her Bible, then maybe she would come to the understanding that women were not allowed to teach men about Christ. This happened in the year 1918, when the Progress Cumberland Presbyterian Church was celebrating its eighth birthday. The same woman applied for ordination, Ada Slayton, with the Presbyterian Church in 1914. At this same church, the woman is only four years old. According to her writings, it didn't bother her as she had dealt with this kind of mentality for the last six years. In Ada's own words, she said, that's how long it took for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church to give me my ordination as a minister in the church after my first application in 1914. That's how long it took for me to pass every known obstacle that they could come up with, every known one that they threw at me. Now, how did that stranger that day put it? Study my Bible? Ada continued in her notes, only one verse in all the scriptures indicates women shouldn't teach men. And during a lifetime of reading the Bible, Eight years of higher education study in biblical translation and scholarship, and the process of becoming one of the first ordained women to preach in the South. I heard 1 Timothy 2 verse 12 more times than I could count. And it says, But I do not allow a woman to teach. I do not allow a woman to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. This scripture was not only told to her by so many men, even men in the General Assembly at the church, but also by her husband, Sidney Slayton. Interestingly, in verses 8 through 11 earlier, Paul also tells women not to wear gold not to wear pearls or any kind of expensive fashionable clothes and men not, men not to use anger none of which I ever heard orated on whatsoever recently I asked in one of my surveys on an earlier podcast what my listeners were told growing up about why women couldn't be pastors many of the answers I received from people were a host of reasons. Women couldn't be pastors. After all, 
women are far too emotional because women might tempt men with their bodies. Give me a break, right? (laughs) Another one, because women have their monthly time of the month, because women couldn't handle so much work, or because a woman's voice is too soft and couldn't be heard well? These answers, (laughs) these answers reveal to me that the majority of the objections, most of the responses that I receive from people in an earlier survey gave me about women preachers are not really whatsoever related to the scriptures in the Bible. Not at all. But instead of stem from their own assumptions about gender. But let's pretend a moment that scripture and not chauvinism is at the root of the issue we're talking about today. The Bible has more to say about women in leadership positions than most of us are often led to believe. And, except for that pesky little message we talked about at Timothy 2.12, the biblical narrative about women leaders is overwhelmingly positive and outweighs this one simple little single verse that so many men in the early days got all hung up on. So, coming up in my main story today are 10 reasons women should be allowed to preach and not sit on the pews and be silent. And before we get started, still, i like you to uh, thank you for sticking with me and listening to this broadcast on my prequel to Mother's Day and before when I come back, I've got a break for just a moment and let my sponsor have their say. Be right back. Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep. Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And now... We're back for the rest of my story. Ada Caston Slayton was received under the care of the Progress Cumberland Presbyterian Church on October 1st, 1914. It was 7.30 in the evening. Then, for a long six years, she studied her Bible from the front cover to the back, over and over. Finally, and I mean finally. In 1920, she was given a license by the Louisiana Presbytery to preach as a probationer. She was also instructed to write a sermon on Romans 8, verse 9. Between when she started her journey on God, calling her in October of 1914, she and five other women became the subjects of vigorous controversy. Finally, in the year 1921, she and four other women, after women's suffrage, gained the right, and let me say the legal right, of ordination. The General Assembly announced at that time, with the time in Aveda's ordination, that the word man, as used in the Holy Scriptures, would have no reference to sex, be it male or female. Thus, on November 5th, 1920, the Reverend Ada Caston Slayton was ordained as the First Lady of the Cloth in the Louisiana Presbytery and the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. She was one of six other women across the United States to gain the first legal ordination. Let's talk about the first reason. 
The following women often get overlooked in the Bible. But even though we don't have long stories about them today, their leadership abilities are still written down in the scriptures. Let's go to Luke for just one moment. We find a woman, her name is Anna, who was a prophet along with the four daughters of Philip, who also prophesied. In the biblical sense, a prophet is a truth teller who delivers God's message to people worldwide. In other words, everything we know about a preacher or minister in today's society, hmm, more precisely, an evangelical preacher like Ada Slayton Bonds who could really, really pack a punch. Then there's also Phoebe, who was a deacon, and she is found in Romans. And Junia, who the Bible designates not only as an apostle, but an outstanding one at that. Along with her husband, Priscilla is someone Paul names as a co-worker in Christ found in Acts 18. This great oracle, Priscilla, taught Apollos, an educated man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Despite his high intellect and education, Priscilla was able to explain the ways of God much more adequately. He in no way expressed any dismay at her gender. In many of the passages where she is mentioned, Priscilla's name is listed before her husband. This is noteworthy in a culture that usually placed husband's names first, suggesting Priscilla, rather than Aquila, was the leader of this particular couple. The women in the scriptures are defined the words spoken by the man who walked out of Ada's church on that Mother's Day in 1921. And to think I'm just getting started. Okay, now follow me here. Let's go back to Luke in the Bible one more time. Did you know that the very first Christian ministers were all women? You're sitting there now saying, what are you talking about? No, seriously, they were all women. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, women were the first ones to learn of Christ's resurrection when he appeared to them. And they were the very first people to share this news with others. Depending on which gospel that you read, the first proclaimer is either Mary Magdalene and the other, Mary, Jesus Christ's mother. Then there was also Joanna and others told in the gospel of Luke. So the very first time the story of the resurrection was told, it was proclaimed by a woman. Think about it, just, just for a moment. If women had kept their words silent in the church, there wouldn't be a church, would there? Then let's go to talking about the woman at the well who abandoned her water jar. After talking with Jesus, this woman left her water jar behind at the well to go and tell the people all about Jesus. She left behind what she came to the well to do because she found the work that she considered was far more critical. Shortly afterwards, the scriptures report that many Samaritans believed in Christ because her testimony demonstrated she was quite an influential evangelist. The conversation Jesus had with her in the Gospel of John was the most extended recorded conversation Jesus had with anyone. Why would Jesus spend all that time talking divinity with a woman if he didn't want her to tell anyone about it? Christ didn't get upset with her for leaving her water jar back there at the well. Her other work behind at the well. Instead, 
he encourages her spiritual pursuits and questions, then welcomes all those people she led to him. Nope, there are no absences of women leaders in the Old Testament either. You know, there are absences of outspoken women in the Old Testament that will blow your mind sometimes. As an example only here, Deborah was named in the scriptures as a prophetess and a judge. But people came to her for words from God. She led, she directed, and she guided them. And no one appeared to object because she was a woman. Huh. Well, in Judges, the same thing took place in, in my story that I told earlier in my podcast, which was about Samson and Deliah. Deborah led the people in song after leading them to triumph in battle. Without her leadership, the people would not fight on their own behalf. Then there were overlooked women of the Bible who were great leaders among men. For some reason, Hulda is always overlooked by the men who say women can't teach. Women shouldn't preach in the church, though she was anything but invisible in her own day. As the story goes, King Joshua's men were cleaning out the temple when they discovered a scroll of the Book of Law, which was given by Moses. Joshua asked several men, including the high priest, to go inquire of the Lord about the contents of the scroll. So, who did all those influential men seek out for answers from God? Hulda. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. A woman. It's worth noting that Hulda was married, but they went to her, not her husband, who was the king. It is also worth noting that Hulda was a contemporary of male prophets. She was just like Jeremiah or Nahum. The king's men had many great options and they still chose Hulda. She doesn't just instruct men, men seek out her instruction. If the king of Judah wasn't afraid to listen to a woman, why should any of them be either, right? Now let's talk about the first woman to become a prophet. Miriam was the first person in Hebrew scripture to be named a prophet. I'm not talking about her as a woman. I'm talking about her as the first prophet ever, period. Also, Moses wouldn't have led the Israelites exodus if it wasn't for his sister, Miriam, who kept watch over his tiny little basket floating down the river. I bet y'all remember that in the Ten Commandments and ensured her baby brother was cared for. If it weren't for his mother and if it weren't for the two Hebrew midwives who were Shipra and Pua, if it weren't for Pharaoh's daughter, and then later his wife, Zipporah, saved Moses' life again and again. If it wasn't for the women delivering Moses over and over back then, the man seen on the silver screen in the great movie, The Ten Commandments, who delivered the Hebrew people, wouldn't be around. Esther once saved all the Jewish people from slaughter which was hardly a minor accomplishment. Easily swayed by the petty and vengeful desires of one of his esteemed nobles named Haman, King Exertus signed a law which ordered the massacre of the Jewish people, much like Hitler did in World War II. Had it not been for the bold intervention of Queen Esther, many, many people would have perished for no logical reason whatsoever. 
I would challenge anyone who says women are too emotional to be leaders to take a look at the two powerful men in the book of Esther, Haman and the king. Then look at the two quasi-powerful women in the story, Queen Esther and Queen Vashi, and tell me which gender acts according to emotional charge and which gender acts methodically and reasonably. For example, in the story, King Exertus gets really, really drunk and requests that Queen Vashti come dance in front of the drunken men for their view and enjoyment, a command Queen Vashti quite soberly (laughs) refused. Now, let me ask you this. Which gender acts with appropriate restraint and which gender is entirely out of control? Which gender is motivated by their own interest? And which gender demonstrates concern for her people's integrity and safety? You will find that there really isn't any contest when you do this. The women undeniably take the blue ribbon. In my story, the Spirit of God fell upon 70 elders who started prophesying inside the tent of the meeting. But Eldad and Medad started prophesying on the outside of the tent, outside the approved parameters. Do you remember Moses' assistant Joshua? He got so angry about this unauthorized preaching and rushed to find his good friend Moses. He demanded that Moses stop them. But, surprisingly, Moses replied that he wished all people were prophets. And the word all is the key that this included women since his very own sister Miriam was God's first prophet. You know the man I mentioned in the early part of the broadcast who walked out of Miss Ada's church outside that small town of Pleasant Hill, Louisiana after she greeted the congregation by the door. That particular day, Ada was preaching about the two men, Eldad and Medad. How ironic, right? You know, all men, all people, all women shall prophesy. Pentecost Sunday is the day God's Spirit pours out upon everyone. On Pentecost, Peter quoted the prophet Joel as saying, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Furthermore, In the first chapter of Acts is clear that they who gathered included women. So there's no reason to think that when the second chapter of Acts reports they were all together in one place and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. The emphasis that the women were suddenly no longer present. As we near the end of my podcast today, let me point out an interesting newspaper article written about Miss Ada, actively preaching for over 50 years. It was found in a digitized copy of the Birmingham News in Alabama. The article, it reads, Veteran Woman Minister Preaches Old Time Religion. A sprightly grandmother who enjoys preaching the old-time religion, which she considers as applicable in the fast-moving world of today, as when she became an ordained pastor 50 years ago. This is the Reverend Ada Slayton Bonds of Mansfield, Louisiana. 
Miss Bonds is among the ministers attending the General Assembly of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church now being held at the East Lake Cumberland Presbyterian Church. The veteran minister is a pastor at the Progress Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Pleasant Hill, Louisiana. After preaching for 42 years in the churches of the Louisiana Presbytery, Mrs. Bonds, married a second time to Nelson Bonds, has the longest record of service of any woman pastor in the denomination. When asked about difficulties in obtaining ordination, Miss Ada said, young women desiring to enter the ministry must be brave enough to withstand the prejudices which will be directed at them, the veteran minister said. However, she commented that prejudices against women in such positions as the ministry were much less pronounced today than they were way back in the early 1900s. She said that many members of her congregation looked upon her as a mother and told her they felt more free to confide in her for this reason. Ada remembers riding in a horse and buggy to conduct services in four different churches. Her very first car was a Model T Ford, which she recalls driving many miles over the sandy, rigid roads of Louisiana. And in conclusion today, I would like to rest my case on behalf of the Reverend Ada Slayton Bonds of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. While the list could go on and on, yes, I rest my case with the Blessed Mother Mary. I cannot imagine any better argument for women ministers in all of Scripture than Mary herself, who quite literally bore the Word made flesh in her own body and gave birth to Jesus Christ. She carried God around in her belly and then labored to get that good news out of her womb and into the world. If that's not an accurate depiction of preaching, I don't know what is. I'm sure she let love grow within her, fill her out, and expanded her tummy in a way out. I bet she even got stretch marks. She nurtured love and fed love at her breast. She raised love and sent love out into the world and stood vigil when love died. Visited love's tomb and proclaimed love's triumph when love rose from the dead. In addition to the embodied way she ushered the good news into the world, she also prophesied in Luke 1, offering the now infamous song known as the Magnificat. I will conclude here by saying I've occasionally heard people attempt to argue that the rarity of female leaders and disciples and preachers and deacons in Scripture is proof that God intended those positions to be for men, as if a precious few women got the gig only because the men wouldn't take the job when they were supposed to. The fact that any women were leaders, disciples, preachers, and deacons amid a male-controlled society that didn't value women as equal contributors proves that God's call on women could not be deterred even by a culture at the turn of the 20th century like Ada Slayton Bonds, men that didn't readily accept women's gifts. When I ask my Instagram community why they know women can be preachers, several women wrote back and said, because I am one. Or some wrote back and said, because I've seen one in action. You only need one woman to prove that God does not just call men. And, my friends, my listeners out there, 
We have a lot more than one, trust me, both now and in biblical times. So I leave you with this. Listen carefully. If all the women, not just the ones I spoke of in my podcast, had kept silent in the church, guess what? There wouldn't be a church. Well, until later, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, and friends, and neighbors, and loved ones, until my next podcast, which is the Mother's Day podcast, Coming up this Sunday, see you later, alligator. Well, that does it for me for another great episode from Sydney St. James. Be sure to click on the tab above that says send a voice message and I will get it from you and I'll probably play it back on one of my future podcasts. Also, don't forget to click the button follow. I'd love for you to follow my podcast. But it's been fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, here I am, Sydney St. James. Happy listening.